we meet in an hour of change and challenge, in a decade of hope and fear, in an age of both knowledge and ignorance. If this capsule history of our progress teaches us anything, it is that man in his quest for knowledge and progress is determined and cannot be deterred. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to the next episode of the Energy Impact Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Crabb, and I'm really excited to be joined today by Mia Holstead, the Chief Real Assets Officer at Norgus Bank Investment Management. Mia, it's great to have you on. Thank you, Michael. It's great to be here as well. Um, well, I can't wait to get into all the exciting work uh, that you are doing. But first, tell us a little bit about yourself, sort of how did you end up uh, in your current role in, in the kind of finance world? Sure, sure. Uh, so uh, I have always sort of been interested in, in what's going on around me, uh, the international aspects of, uh, of things, uh, and I guess that's uh, what, what put me here in the first place, uh, uh, working with finance. Uh, and uh, I also think that, you know, um, uh, looking back at my career so far, it's a lot of coincidences uh, why I ended up uh, just here. Uh, so uh, I, uh, of education, I hold two master degrees. Uh, so one in professional accountancy uh, and one in, uh, in business and economics. Uh, and uh, after I, I did my studies, I ended up in PwC. Uh, so that was sort of the start of my career. Uh, and I think it was, looking back, it was one of the best places to start. Uh, because <laughs> I, which, which, group with, which group were you in? Which group were you in? I was both in, in audit and consultancy. Uh, so very broad. Uh, and I think that is also something that has sort of given me um, the fundament that I have today, right? Uh, meeting with a lot of different industries, a lot of different uh, relations, uh, getting to know uh, different people, how they worked, uh, learned a lot uh, during those years. Uh, and then this great opportunity uh, came along uh, in Norges Bank. Uh, so I have been here now really in, yeah, since 2010. Uh, so it's uh, 11 years now. So quite a while. Uh, but it's been so many different uh, opportunities along the way. Uh, and, uh, and really, um, the best one that I, I got was, uh, of course, uh, to join the unlisted real estate investment area, which I did back in 2010. Uh, and, and that was a new area uh, back then uh, for the fund, a new asset class, uh, oh, which wow. was about to be built up. Uh, and and so, maybe for our, explain to our listeners sort of unlisted real estate, what, you know, there must be a listed real estate. What is that? You know, what does that all mean? It is, it is. So, uh, so unlisted real estate is really uh, the private or direct investments that we do. Uh, so it's really about sort of uh, owning the building, uh, either through a joint ventureship uh, or 100% uh, as we do in, in Europe as well. Uh, so uh, uh, the listed real estate investments are uh, through stock exchanges, right? So, uh, so it's live data coming through uh, every day. Uh, so, so two different worlds, uh, but the same, uh, same commodity uh, or end product, uh, if you'd like. Uh, so today I, I hold the role as Chief Real Assets Officer, uh, which really means that I'm responsible for both our listed investments uh, in the real estate space and the unlisted real estate uh, investments. Mm -hmm. Uh, and actually, uh, I thought about this before we went on the call, uh, because the portfolio is yeah, approximately uh, 57 billion US dollars, uh, and half of that is in the US. Uh, wow. So that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So what, I mean, you said 57 billion with a B, right? I mean, that yeah, uh, yeah. must be a massive portfolio. So half in the US, uh, is the rest sprinkled throughout Europe? Um, or are you in Africa or APAC, other regions? Where, where do you, um, what's the geography of that? Yeah, uh, on unlisted real estate, we, we do have a very focused strategy. Uh, so we are focusing on, uh, on eight cities in total. Uh, so it's uh, in, in the US, it's uh, Boston, San Francisco, 
uh, DC uh, and New York, <laughs> whilst uh, in Asia it's Tokyo, uh, and in Europe it's uh, Berlin and Paris and London. Uh, so uh, I have a team operating in, in six different offices uh, wow. around the world. Uh, so we have local people on the ground. Uh, and we do most of our investments through joint ventures, meaning that we have partnered up with big companies in the U.S., for instance, Boston Properties and yeah, uh, Kilroy and, and other uh, uh, major players in the market. Uh, and, and that is also something that we're thinking about with this new investment class that I'm also responsible for, uh, the renewable energy assets uh, that we do have a mandate on now. Yeah. yeah, what a great segue. You're, you're doing my job for me. <laughs> uh, so let's let's talk about that. So um, yeah. you started, uh, was, I think you said it was a new investment class, sort of the private, uh, the unlisted real estate back in 2010. And yeah. so they said you did such a great job with that. Let's do it again. Yeah, yeah, of yeah. course. Uh, so uh, so uh, 2020, uh, 1st of January, we got the mandate to invest in renewable energy infrastructure assets. It's a long one. Uh, but uh, the mandate is really uh, a, a very broad mandate, I would say. It's a mandate to invest along the whole value chain. Uh, so, um, so we can be invested in uh, production, transmission, uh, storage distribution of, uh, of renewable energy. Uh, and we are right now focusing on Europe uh, and North America uh, as the geographies, and that is also restricted in the mandate. Um, and uh, we can go up to 120 billion uh, uh, Norwegian kroners, which, uh, which is about, I think, 14 or 15 billion US dollars. Uh, so it's a, a massive mandate, uh, and uh, and we will of course, you know, take uh, the time it takes uh, to invest this. No, no sort of time limits uh, to it. Uh, and an important param- uh, an important thing is that uh, we need to invest uh, alongside joint venture partners. Mm. Uh, so that is really our strategy uh, because this is, you know, a hard industry and, and we don't have uh, the capacity internally uh, to go ahead and do this ourselves. Uh, but um, um, so, so that is a, an important thing that we also did when we built up the real estate investment area. We did it together with joint venture partners. So uh, we, we often tend to sort of say that finding the right partner is uh, as important as finding the right asset. <laughs> uh, it goes hand in hand. Yeah. It always comes down to people, right? Yeah, um, it does. Yeah, it definitely does. how it goes. Sure. So, so really want to get into the joint venture strategy, but let's step back for our listeners and talk a little bit about, um, you know, you keep mentioning the mandate and I, yep. you know, you're in a little bit of a different position than maybe our listeners are used to. So, so talk about kind of how that, um, how that happens and how those decisions yeah. are made. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I, I think for our listeners, I think it's it's really important even maybe to say, take one step back to, to 1969 uh, where Norway struck the oil, right? So uh, so, uh, so we found oil uh, in the North Sea uh, and we had a lot of politicians sort of uh, uh, thinking very smart about this. Uh, so we were lucky in that sense, you know, we, uh, they thought about sort of how to preserve this for future generations. Uh, and that is our mission statement as well, uh, to, to safeguard and build financial wealth for future generations and I, I think it's it's something very beautiful about that right to to sort of work for your children for your children's children for your children's children grandchildren you know <laughs> so, so that is uh, a very important uh, thing to to sort of have in mind for the listeners that this is a generational fund uh, and it's here to uh, to stay uh, so so we really uh, are very careful about how we use this fund in Norway uh, so it's all down to sort of um, a sovereign wealth fund, right, uh, which is managed by uh, the uh, or which is managed on behalf of the Norwegian people. So it all sort of starts with Parliament uh, and then Parliament uh, says to the Ministry of Finance uh, that, uh, you know, this is the law. Uh, you have a mandate uh, which you are to delegate to the central bank. So the Ministry of Finance delegates a mandate to the central bank. And this is where uh, the fund lies today within the Norwegian Central Bank. Yeah. Uh, but important in, in this all is that it's, it's all sort of delegated investment uh, authority. 
So the parliament and the ministry doesn't really have anything to do with day-to-day -day management or investment decisions. Uh, so the CEO is delegated a very clear mandate uh, to, to be commercial uh, in the market and to invest the money abroad. Uh, so we are not to invest the money in Norway. Uh, and that is simply to, uh, to avoid sort of Dutch disease and over upheating the, the economy. Uh, but the way this fund works in Norway is that the politicians, they can, can draw on the fund when it comes to creating the national budget. Uh, so they can draw up to uh, 3% uh, annually, uh, which is uh, what we forecast as the real return on the fund. Oh, wow. uh, and a recent example of that is how privileged we were uh, during the pandemic, right? Uh, so I think the fund then contributed about 25% of our uh, national budget, which is really massive. So, and, and also, Michael, I think it's uh, important for our listeners to, to know about the size of this fund, uh, because it is enormous, right? So it's, it's 1.3 trillion US dollars, uh, and, and half of it is invested in the US. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I so, don't know how to even picture, like, you know, quantify what that really means. No, no, that's that's really hard, right? Yeah. So it's it's counting zeros, and, uh, and I think... Uh, on average, we have about 1.4% ownership in, in all sort of listed companies around the wow. world, uh, 9,000 companies. Uh, so, uh, so a lot of, uh, a lot of ownership in yeah. that. Yeah. Mm. And so, to, um, so you mentioned sort of using uh, the returns on that fund to, you know, fund the gov um, government's budget as well as sort of future generations. So are you using um, sort of cash flow from the portfolio, or are you buying and selling things to, you know, kind of realize those gains to fund the budget, or maybe a combination of both? No, I think, you know, we, we are using uh, the real return on the fund. Uh, so, um, uh, so when it comes to uh, what I do, or what I am responsible for on the unlisted side, that is a really important part of it all uh, to, to sort of have stable cash flows into the fund. Uh, you know, so, so that is a part of, of the overall mission, why we are in unlisted assets, uh, and especially in real estate and renewable energy infrastructure. So, so that is something else than, uh, you know, the equity side and the fixed income side. Uh, so it is, uh, yeah, uh, what we think is the real return of the fund, which is about uh, 3% every year. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, very, uh, um, very national sort of inspirational mission, too. It's a big responsibility. So it is, um, it is. Uh, and I think uh, it is something that uh, may not be that familiar uh, to every listener out there, uh, who we are and, and who, uh, yeah, uh, how large it is, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah and it's also, be. it's also, you know, the mission statement is, uh, it's such a nice one. Uh, and, and what we do uh, is also uh, acting through responsible investment. Uh, so uh, we are really uh, trying to be um, uh, responsible in every uh, investment that we do, but always with a financial mission, you know, so not to be uh, kind, but uh, of course to, to uh, yeah, uh, to earn money. Yeah, yeah, the tri triple bottom line or yeah. whatever people use has, has profit as one of the pillars, um, but there are others, Absolutely. of course. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, one, what well, you said, one point three trillion. I mean, anything after the decimal really is. Yeah. You know, um, <laughs> how many people manage? Uh, you know, you mentioned sort of leveraging JVs. How, how many people are part of the fund that are you know responsible for finding investments and managing those investments? We are in total, uh, I think, about five hundred and forty people right now, uh, something around that. So, uh, so it's a very cost-efficient uh, yeah, fund as well. A, yeah, it's a lot of work. <laughs> it is. It is. So uh, a large, uh, large sum on every head, right? But, uh, but I think uh, you are pointing to something which is is very uh, important, right? Because most of the investments are uh, within the listed space. Uh, so we have um, uh, in, in the mandate from the ministry, it says that we can allocate about uh, or up to 70% in equities uh, and up to 30% in fixed income. Uh, 
Uh, and, and then you have this unlisted uh, space, which I am operating in, which is way more uh, human intensive, right? It, it requires more uh, and because it's not standardized, right? And it doesn't sort of uh, go through listed stock exchanges uh, and, and just flow through the system. It needs manpower. Uh, so it's like a shop in the shop, if you'd like. Uh, and, uh, and in my area, we are just south of 60 uh, people uh, globally. So not too many people either, uh, but uh, we rely heavily on our partners, right? Uh, so to find those partners uh, in real estate with the local competency on the market, having people on the market or in the market uh, managing the assets is really, really important to us. And when it comes to renewables, it's not about sort of finding the local partners, but the partners with the best expertise, right? Mm. Because it's a different game. Uh, so, uh, so that is, uh, for instance, that investment that we did uh, recently back in, in April, um, uh, the, the wind farm in the Netherlands. Uh, the, one of the sort of very important things about that one is exactly our partner, Ersted, which is uh, the proven sort of market leader in the game, right? Uh, so, uh, yeah, I guess we'll come back to that later, but, uh, yeah, well, but again, I mean, the partner strategy is really important. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So, uh, a lot of ways we can go, let, let, let's go to the JV strategy and sort of the timeline leading up to the first investment, right? So you kind of described parliament says, okay, we want to be in renewable energy. Mm -hmm. Here you go, Mia, figure it out, find our partners, yeah. you know, what, so what do you, what do you do? I mean, you had you had a you had focused cities and real estate, which is somewhat transferable, as but mm -hmm. still labor intensive as you described. Mm -hmm. Going to mm -hmm. a renewable energy industry that is massive and mm -hmm. feels like it's doubling, you know, every week. Yeah, yeah. How did you kind of <laughs> where where do you start? You know, no, where do you start? It's uh, it's a good question, Michael, uh, and. And I think uh, what really was helpful for us uh, as a team was uh, was the experiences that we had through the unlisted real estate space, right? Uh, so when things are unlisted, that's at least uh, one combinator or one one yeah one thing to start from. Uh, and and I think um, entering into a new asset class for the fund as well uh, is also demanding, right? Because you we we are. Uh, we are a team in, in the chief real assets officer area, but then again, it's, it's other teams as well, which needs to be involved and which needs to learn this new asset class. So it's all about sort of sharing information and, and collaborating. Uh, and, uh, and luckily we had all this experience from the unlisted space uh, in the real estate uh, area. So, so we have sort of drawn a lot on that experience and looked to uh, what the pitfalls were back then. And, uh, and I think uh, one, of the, one of the learning points was of course that let's start with the JVs, you know, because uh, then we, we do have the competency out there. So, so that was sort of laying the strategy when we had the mandate from the ministry. Uh, it's it's clear sort of how the funnel goes, right? This is your mandate, and 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 then you need to sort of build out the strategy from there. Uh, and important then is to sort of focus on uh, how much can we do uh, in the beginning, uh, which uh, the renewable space is is enormous, right? So so where do we start? And and our focus area right now is uh, offshore wind and solar. Mm -hmm. So that is what it says in in the strategy. Although we can do so much more. You know, but uh, but these are technologies uh, which we need to uh, get our heads around, right? Uh, and then you need to find the partner. You need to enter different countries, and all the countries have different setups when it comes to subsidies, when it comes to regulation, how you're going to structure the investment. Uh, so, for from our point of view, uh, I think the best advice we can give is sort of to to start narrow you know, uh, focus on something. Mm. Uh, so, uh, so we have focused, uh, although it says offshore wind and solar, we have mainly been focusing on, uh, or sorry, it says uh, offshore and onshore wind and solar, but we have mainly been focusing on offshore wind. Uh, and reason for that is simply because it's, it's large projects. So we can deploy a lot of capital into one project, which is important to us. And that also goes back to, you know, being cost efficient, uh, having a small team in the beginning. Uh, so creating that sort of uh, fundament in the portfolio is, is really important to us. Yeah. 
And, and so could you share some more about how the JV with Orsted came out? It sounds like you did, you know, sort of a mapping of the renewable space and the different technologies and you settled on, uh, you know, a narrower subset. So it's kind of technology first and then JV. Is that kind of how it came about? Yeah, I would say so. Uh, and, and the team would uh, be better to talk about this than, <laughs> than what I am, right? Because they are sort of laying out the grounds and, and then they come to me and this is the strategy. And I think it sounds great, you know? Uh, I have a couple of questions here and there. And uh, so they are really the experts. I feel like, you're, the under, I feel like you're underselling your involvement <laughs> in all of this, but that's okay. Yeah, no, but uh, but I would love to have them here and, and, and to show you uh, these experts because they, they are just uh, the best, you know, uh, but um, but it, it's it's really about, yeah, uh, we, we entered into offshore wind uh, and, and then you look at the opportunity space, what's what's sort of in, in the market now, which can fit our strategy and and what we uh, look for is first and foremost, you know, the large ticket size. Uh, and then sort of the market, of course, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, limited to Europe and North America. So we are looking in those markets, what, what is moving, which is large in those markets. Okay, which partner uh, is, is on this? So, uh, who has constructed it? Uh, and who will be our, uh, our maintenance and operating partner in this? Uh, and, and who's the seller also, you know? So being a sovereign wealth fund, uh, it's sort of, uh, you, you know that you have all this scrutiny on you. You know that you need to do the best investments. You you are buying it to hold it. You know we are not buying it to flip it or to sell it within a couple of years. We are a long term investor, and that is really really important uh, than to make the right decisions mm -hmm. at the beginning. You know, uh, so um, and I think also one important thing which which I haven't mentioned is that. In this business, it's a lot about also having leverage on, right? Uh, most uh, most partners need leverage, uh, whilst we are in that lucky position that we don't need leverage, uh, and and we can be a very efficient partner in that way. You know, uh, we don't need a consortium either. Uh, we can we can take on very large deals. Uh, so so that is something which I think a lot of uh, our competitors uh, can't. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit of a small, it starts to be an increasingly small universe of folks that can really cut those checks, right? It, it does, it does. And they become larger and larger, right? So uh, so I think that is a real competitive advantage hmm. uh, because in the minute you take on leverage, uh, you know, you you all of a sudden, you, you pay out uh, all your subsidies in the beginning, for instance, uh, you know, they go directly to the, the, to the financial loan. Uh, it's a lot of reporting hassle. It's a lot of structuring that needs to be done so uh so i think that is a real competitive advantage yeah yeah so kit let's uh can we unpack that a little bit um because you know i i'm sure there are competitors or peers or you know other investors out there that say well that allows me to sort of double my return right leverage uh yep. you know increases whatever the outcome is positive or negative um, yeah yeah so how do you think about that and sort of your return uh, I, I know you can't share much about sort of your return targets, but but it changes <laughs> it changes the the um, it changes the game a little bit, right? Um, yeah, and, and so, yeah. have you seen that be a competitive advantage, or you know, have there been folks that you know maybe beaten you to projects because they're willing to be a little more aggressive? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think you're right. You know, uh, people can be a more more aggressive uh, due to leverage, uh, but that is also something that we factor in uh, into our pricing. Uh, and I think uh, in in our mindset, it's it's really an advantage uh, not being uh, uh, forced to take on leverage, uh, and and we can take on leverage if we'd like to. Uh, so so it's in our mandate, you know. Uh, but it's just something about the mindset uh, of why we are doing this uh, and how we want to. Uh, uh, to to sort of cash in those subsidies which you get in the beginning uh, instead of uh, sort of uh, selling it all out. Uh, so that is an important factor in these investments for us to sort of uh, be able to uh, uh, to not be exposed to direct sort of power price uh, risk. Uh, so that is why we prefer uh, either uh, power purchase agreements or subsidies in these uh, these projects, uh, and then we prefer to get it into the fund, uh, mm. and having that stable income uh, and that diversifier to the fund. Uh, so that is sort of the whole sort of thought train on that. Uh, 
and I guess that comes full circle to what you were describing with the budget, right? So some real yeah. return, you're not paying that out in interest and principal, you're using True. it to continue to sort of fund uh, part, part of the government, not, not yeah. all. So. Huh, so super interesting. So you talked about PPA sort of revenue contracts, uh, contracts and constructs. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit about how you know, that's evolved, how it may be different from the real estate world. I mean, we've had a lot of different guests that have a lot of different business models. So it's super yeah. interesting, I think, for people to hear kind of what you've seen and, and, and how, you've, uh, how you've managed that part of the risk. Yeah, yeah. Now, so so this is something totally different than what we have in the uh, in the real estate space, right? Uh, because you don't you don't have subsidies there. So uh, so uh, so I think uh, what is Im important to us now in the beginning is to sort of uh, look at what kind of subsidies do you have on on each project, and and that is of course also mirrored in in the in the price of the projects, right? Uh, so uh, and and also in the competition on the different projects. Uh, so I think for what we see in the market right now is that, of course, uh, the subsidies are getting lower and lower, uh, and we need to be prepared for a time where there are no subsidies anymore. Uh, but what you need to look for then, uh, I guess, is, is more the, the power purchase uh, agreements uh, which are in place. Uh, and, and I think that is also something that, uh, that may, um, may be uh, more and more attractive for companies as, uh, as you would like more and more renewable energy uh, into your business. Uh, uh, so it will be exciting to sort of follow uh, in, in the market uh, when we get there. Uh, but I think uh, it's definitely some of uh, the things that we are monitoring the most. So sort of how are these things developing? Uh, how do we capture that risk in the future? Uh, and these are sort of supply and demand uh, things, right? So which you, you, is really, really hard to forecast. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, but we, our team is, of course, doing a great job on that. Uh, but, but it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I, I mean, as soon as I find someone that can perfectly predict the future, <laughs> I'm gonna make sure. Send to, them my way. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll see. Yeah. I mean, I mean yeah. it's kind of the exciting part of it, right? Um, yeah, it is. Of and, course. Yeah. And offshore wind is probably. I mean, it seems like there's this sort of uh, dual-edged sword. You have this advantage that you're so big. Um, but it, is it harder to disrupt those models? I mean, a, a company can take a small battery PPA, for example, mm. or a small solar mm. project. Mm. But, mm. you know, uh, what comp have you found traction with companies, you know, contracting for offshore wind? I mean, I, that seems. No, and that, that is, yeah, uh, you, you're totally right. Uh, it's, it's a big advantage being as large as we are. Uh, but it's also it makes it more challenging as well. Right. Because you need to have scale. Uh, and and that is of course uh, yeah very demanding and and very hard yeah so yeah. you're you're spot on yeah yeah and so I guess it's just maybe it's thinking about sort of the technology evolution timeline right mm, um, mm. and and so how much you know I don't want to put words in your mouth but so you're sort of in the <laughs> you're in the more developed technologies right yeah. that have started yeah. to really scale I mean mm -hmm. offshore the first offshore wind where you mm -hmm. know tens of megawatts mm -hmm. and then now they're thousands right mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. um are you sort of monitoring some of the earlier stage technologies or you know by the time it's ready for you it, you know you'll sort of see it I mean how, how do you yeah. sort of balance that yeah, and I, uh, and I think, uh, you know, you, you're right. We are monitoring all the technologies uh, that sort of come to the market, uh, but and some more than others, of course. But uh, where we are at now, uh, in the very beginning, sort of, we, we got our mandate back in 2020, right? So it's just like one year or one Still and a half year. year. Yeah. So, uh, so what we are focusing on right now, which uh, is also because we have a small team, is offshore wind and mature uh, technology. Uh, so we are not currently sort of looking at floating uh, wind or uh, or those uh, hydrogen technologies, etc. Uh, I, I think that um, that is also something that are for uh, the future, of course, uh, when things become more and more mature. And that was also the way we did it with real estate, just looking at different geographies. We started out in Europe, close to home. Then we went on to uh, the US and then we uh, opened up for, uh, for Asia. Uh, the same we'll do with technologies, although the mandate, as I mentioned, is already there, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, the strategy, that's where we have sort of narrowed it. Uh, yeah. 
fascinating yeah it's kind of a fun puzzle to unpack <laughs> yeah. and, and I know we're a little restricted on you know pushing you too hard about future investments but mm-hmm. maybe talk about what you feel is sort of the greatest challenge to you around executing this strategy and sort of serving this broad mandate both the written mandate and, and the unwritten sort of societal mm-hmm. mandate that you mm-hmm. have mm-hmm. No, I think I think the biggest challenge uh, we have sort of already touched on it, right? To find the right project, which sort of ticks all the boxes. Um, and I think we did that very well with that first investment uh, in in the Netherlands, which was, you know, uh, I think it still is uh, Netherlands' uh, largest uh, operational uh, wind park today. Uh, and I think it's uh, still the world's uh, second largest operational wind park. Uh, it's like twice the size of Manhattan, uh, and it uh, it serves uh, I think one million Dutch households when it comes to power uh, annual annual electricity consumption. So so it's uh, it's sort of finding those right ones, right? Uh, so that was a major ticket size. Uh, it was with Ersted, which was you know, or is uh, our preferred partner. Uh, it's, uh, they have proven experience uh, and they're, they have a great ESG profile. Uh, it was long subsidies, you know, lasting for 15 years. Uh, so, so it's sort of when we, when we do the maths, you, you get your invested amount uh, back during that subsidy period. Uh, almost all of it. So, so that is also something that we look at, and and ticking all of those boxes, mm. you know, that is uh, our major challenge, of course, because you, as I mentioned, also we're not sort of buying anything to sort of flip it uh, a couple of years later. Uh, we are buying to hold, uh, and and then we we need to look long into the future, and and using those lenses are really hard beyond the subsidy period, right? Uh, so, uh, so I think that is. Um, uh, of course, uh, everyone's challenge so to sort of forecast what will happen in this area in the future. Uh, it's uh, impossible, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it takes the kind of whole ecosystem. I think one of the fun things about this podcast is you yeah. hear stories kind of from all these perspectives. Um, and maybe talk about, uh, we're running a little low on time, but talk about sort of the real estate diligence process and how that, you know, differs from because you know, they're both law, you have similar philosophies, right? Long term mm-hmm. hold, unlisted mm-hmm. real assets. But I think the differences end pretty quickly, I would imagine. And having just gone through that yourself, maybe you could share some of the lessons learned from that. Yeah. Now, I think uh, when uh, when we started on, on this area, the renewable area, we, we looked to the real estate area, as I mentioned. And I think, you know, uh, immediately you sort of think that, OK, it's two unlisted areas. Uh, it's real assets, both of them. Uh, it, it may be uh, quite similar, right? Uh, but of course it isn't, you know, <laughs> and you quickly uh, realize that. Uh, but uh, but the most sort of uh, similar part for me is is maybe the transaction process uh, and it's it's a long process you know it takes about uh, three to nine months uh, and uh, and I think you know the due diligence part is really uh, a major part for us because we would like to sort of uh, turn every brick uh, and and really kick the tires of everything uh, and we use a lot of external advisors to do so as well uh, and I think um, the ESG part is, of course, uh, uh, a major uh, part of renewables, which we also do on real estate, but it's a mm. totally different game here. And, and it's a different game uh, when it comes to the different technologies as well. Uh, and offshore wind uh, is, of course, uh, less demanding, I would say, than, than onshore wind. Uh, so, so that is also maybe how's, why how's, we... How so? I wouldn't have expected that. What... what... No, but offshore wind is not your uh, close to your house, right? So, uh, so it's something about sort of uh, what do you meet where and and when, uh, and also the phase that we go into these projects. Uh, it's not a coincidence that we have uh, sort of done operational projects so far, although the mandate opens for construction and it also opens for development. But sort of uh, starting out in the safe 
space uh, is is also a strategy, right? Yeah. Uh, so, but but pointing to you know we we do I think the due diligence process uh, is really similar on on real estate and uh, and renewables, uh, and the structuring process is also quite similar. Uh, but I would say that uh, you know the it's it's a bit more heavy on the ESG side uh, on uh, on renewables. Uh, but uh, but else, I think it's it's pretty similar. Yeah. So I mean, talk more about what ESG kind of means in that context, because I think on its face, right, clearly renewable. You know, that's that's the E part of the equation. But talk about mm-hmm. how the other components sort of play into this whole process. Mm. No, I think uh, I think uh, looking at offshore wind uh, and that wind park that we uh, bought in the Netherlands, uh, it was fully auctioned, right? So, so the the Dutch government had already done all of that ESG uh, investigation, uh, and also having Ørsted as the partner uh, was uh, was sort of our main. Uh, uh, sort of component in it all, although we did a lot of internal uh, checks as well on everything from sort of uh, sea life to uh, uh, what's going on uh, uh, in the long run, how, how do we sort of uh, cater for uh, birds and everything that uh, uh, yeah, has annual cycles, you know, and, and all of that is important that uh, our partner knows how to deal with. Uh, so, so I think that was how we managed uh, all of uh, environmental, social, and governance uh, aspects of it all. Yeah, yeah, and that really, um, you know, has that been a recent theme across your whole portfolio? I mean, it's really sort of taken off, and it, it's fascinating to me how it doesn't stop at just the the E part of it, right? That this, yeah, yeah. these are construction projects, and they impact people's lives, and they employ people, and they're such key drivers to sort of national growth in, mm, in the jurisdictions mm, where they are. So mm, um, mm. I just, it's always really interesting to me to hear. It's how very interesting. That. Yeah. yeah, it is. And and it's it's big in the real estate space as well. You know, real estate is one of the industries, which I think may have gotten uh, a bit uh, easy under the radar uh, for some years. And uh, and it's like buildings, it's, it's 40% of the CO2, right? So it's, yeah. It's uh, it's a lot on on that space which we are working on uh, and and putting out a sustainability strategy on all our assets, uh, getting them to uh, to be uh, carbon neutral, you know, and uh, and all of that is uh, is just getting bigger and bigger. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah. Well, that that's really interesting. So is there some sort of dovetailing of these two strategies at some point? I mean, does it? I mean, does it feel like? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, how do you how do you keep everything separate but not separate, right? I mean, given your size, it seems like there's some interesting synergies there. Absolutely, um, but again, you need to have scale, right, for for them to sort of connect. Uh, but but hopefully, they will do in the future, and we'll find some way of sort of connecting it all. Uh, I think uh, what is is really great about being in this uh, uh, environment and being in Norges Bank is that you have a lot of expertise uh, on ownership and ESG, and uh, you know it's a it's a whole department working on that. You know, with all our nine thousand companies, uh, so so we we have a lot of expertise in the house, and the important thing is to sort of be able to use that and be able to collaborate. And that is something we do uh, in uh, in um, uh, with my area, with other areas like the risk area and the ownership area. We all have projects where we sort of uh, look at how we can bring this all together uh, and plan for the future. So um, definitely really very interesting and very yeah. exciting. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I wish I could be a fly on the wall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, well, anything else? We'll, we'll kind of close to wrapping up here. Anything else that you want to share um, about the firm, about the future, about your role? Uh, anything that we didn't touch on that you'd like to talk about? No, uh, I, I think we have covered a lot uh, during this uh, this session. Uh, it's been great speaking with you, uh, and I hope that our listeners also have have learned a lot of uh, of Norges Bank, and uh, and they are of course uh, very welcome to contact us if there is anything that uh, yeah. Uh, they would like to know more about uh, in the future. That's uh, very welcome. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Well, really great having you on, Mia. It was an absolute pleasure and looking thank forward you. to uh, seeing more announcements from your firm in the future. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Our leadership in science and industry, our hopes for peace and security, 
our obligations to ourselves as well as others all require us to make this effort to solve these mysteries, to solve them for the good of all men and for the progress of all people.